uh, first of all, this is a great honor for me uh, to take part in this uh, multiplied event co-organized by the University of Uppsala and Kherson National Technical University. And thank you, Sonia, again for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this event. And I'm very sorry for the camera off, but I hope uh, uh, my presentation will be sufficient here. Uh, so, since this multiplier event um, aims uh, to address bridging aspects, as already mentioned by Sonia, my topic, or let's say my talk, will focus uh, on values in general sense, then um, continue with the integrity as a value and its linkage to organizational culture. So I will also focus on deviance and explain how it is contextualized when it comes to application of integrity as the value. In my talk, uh, you shouldn't expect uh, to find easy answers. Uh, however, my expectation is to introduce uh, your in-depth reflection, how integrity should be framed and align when it comes to different contexts. To do so, let me first to start with the observation that um, uh, there are different typologies of values and integrity as such is always here, but it might be labeled under different categories. Since uh, there are a few typologies, I'd like to spot one that I found uh, cognate. Um, this is the one developed by Kanagan. Uh, in fact, um, I chose the typology of public values because um, it is admitted that all academic work should serve for the public good, public interest, and it is truly so and I which I hope it hasn't changed yet, it is important to figure out what public values are. Uh, Kanagan distinguishes um, four categories of public values, as you might see on your screen. Uh, these are ethical values, democratic values, professional values, and human values. Integrity along with honesty, is placed among ethical values. Uh, other values seem also to be relevant to academia, uh, particularly in terms of uh, university social responsibility that is expected to be values driven at least. So um, it might be implied that uh, integrity is one of the core values in academia. Uh, and to evidence this implication, Molina, another scholar, explored the cross-sectoral values and their context. He found out that um, the importance of values diverge by sector. However, not all values are in the same position or in, are in the same way important. Uh, so his findings show that honesty and integrity are greatly important for three sectors uh, that he explored. Uh, these are public, non-profit, and private sectors. However, transparency is listed among important values rather for the public sector than for the private one. Uh, given that, um, I'm not going to dig in more detail what are the reasons of it, but I suggest considering uh, the organizational culture as part of the context that might play a key role here. Uh, in one of my studies, I explored institutional values described in strategies of Lithuanian public universities. In that study, I followed McNay's claim that institutional values are well linked to organizational culture. Uh, this means that um, it is possible to envisage what organizational culture prevails by what values an organization exposes. 
uh, overall, uh, four organizational cultures were distinguished, such as collegiate, bureaucratic, corporate, and enterprise. And certain values were aligned to each of them. Uh, and these values echo the typology of values developed by Wieland. So by combining two conceptual typologies, empirical data were collected, as I mentioned, uh, from Lithuanian public universities. And as you might see, each organizational culture is described through certain values. Uh, so my research showed that in Lithuanian public universities, institutional values related to enterprise culture is more often than others mentioned in the strategies. Um, nevertheless, um, it still remains unclear whether these values exposed in the strategies are well functioning in practice or they are rather in expectation, what is to be achieved. Um, so definitely I mentioned here just one of numerous other contexts that might affect what values are chosen to follow, how the values might be affected or with uh, what they might be interlinked. This surely needs a, a careful glimpse so broad perspective. So I will stop here for a while speaking about values um, in general sense. And here I'd like to raise uh, uh, a more provocative que question, which is um, our values contextualize in the same way as deviants. Uh, this is not surprising that uh, following values is about good, Meanwhile, deviance is about something that goes wrong or bad, and this is kind of common understanding. Um, deviance is seen as uh, harmful, uh, contra-conventional, negative. Um, such misbehavior was investigated through different theoretical lenses, such as crime theories, deterrence theories, and um, I do believe there are some others, uh, as the body of the literature in this field is growing, not only by making to understand why this is happening, but also what remedies could be applied um, to prevent it. So, um, my perspective here is not to go through each theory, but to share how deviance is contextualized. Uh, so about 40 years ago, Hilbert published a study that uh, uh, evidenced the linkage between academic cheating and a prospective behavior in the workplace. And I would say that was probably the first uh, attempt uh, with a sound uh, evidence uh, that showed a clear linkage uh, between cheating in academia and cheating in the workplaces. Uh, 10 years later, Davis and Ludwigson proved uh, that cheating um, does not appear at university. Actually, it emerges much earlier. They explored at which stage deviance emerges and uh, claim that signs of where deviance start appearing when students attend a high school. This important finding helped to realize that efforts put uh, at the university or by the university might be uh, ineffective or inefficient. So that reminds a bit of uh, a kind of fight with windmills. So embeddedness of integrity and other values must be seen as a continuous commitment to coherent values-driven approach. And that's why I see values in a very important uh, subject when we speak about uh, promotion of academic integrity or research integrity, or if we mention academic ethics and research ethics. So 
these findings, uh, the ones by Hilbert as well by Davis and Ludwigson, had a huge impact. They transformed uh, recruitment policies uh, in practice as well as strategies. So integrity uh, tests became the most frequently used uh, test in pre-employment procedure. Uh, also in line with these findings, another observation could be made, which is uh, that um, it's insufficient to have a code of ethics. Indeed, a code of ethics must be practiced through different means, such as strategies, training, and so forth. So definitely that depends on the institution, uh, what exactly it intends to change and what kind of uh, uh, strategies it needs to implement uh, all together with the means. Um, also, um, it, it says that um, when an institution has already a code of ethics, other means should be combined. And uh, having a code of ethics is not um, an all issues or all risk solutions. So in addition to that, I'd say that consequences should be discussed here too, to realize the uh, extent of uh, this complexity. So uh, the scale and level of consequences uh, depend uh, on the sector or I would say even the country. For example, the country with high corruption will struggle to receive uh, efficient and effective uh, investment. Uh, similarly, such risks exist in academia. For example, paper mills undermine trust in science. Um, using contract cheating or artificial intelligence, such as ChatGPT or any other, as they are multiple, raises doubts about the definition of intellectual contribution. So, what is in these days an intellectual contribution? It also starts raising doubts about the profession of scientists. So, what they are going to produce by themselves. Likewise, uh, diploma mills jeopardize trust in higher education quality uh, as well as institutional reputation. So having capacity to deal with the possible consequences and genuine efforts to enable it show the, um, uh, the happening of embeddedness of values. Um, Evans defined integrity as a cornerstone of good governance. And I would say that all values for which a university opts are a bedrock of good governance. So how to achieve it uh, in light uh, of integrity and its students? Because we have to speak uh, from both perspective as uh, integrity promotion and its deviance is our kind of two sides of the same coin that uh, exist in practice. Um, I would refer to ethics infrastructure as the entirety of different means that helps to embed a value-driven approach in everyday practice. This is definitely a challenging work and uh, that it takes long years. Um, so there is a need to involve multiple stakeholders, the most relevant ones, uh, and to hear their voice in this. Uh, and uh, as already mentioned, a code of ethics is the must, but it is insufficient. Uh, there should be guidance, training, consultancy, policy regulation, and so on that leads to these desirable changes, which is mean changing the behavior, uh, stopping neutralizing malpractices, and uh, focusing on what the good is. So to testify is this, uh, there is uh, another interesting study by Solowki. He identified that um, in the business sector, neither employees nor clients are aware of the overarching integrity. 
That means that uh, employees couldn't trace coherence of values and they're practicing through, let's say, brand decision-making and so forth. So to cope with it, many means and approaches could be used. However, uh, I'd like to focus uh, on ethical governance as uh, a part of good governance, as uh, directly interlaying how the it works systematically, uh, or let's say how this complexity could be um, uh, uh, could be better understood. Uh, in terms of efficiency and effectiveness in change management. So um, the concept of ethical governance is definitely broad. It, it, it doesn't cover only one or two elements, as you might see in the list provided suggested by Evans. So it encompasses um, ethical leadership that is described by leading by example, and uh, creating a professional working environment for staff. Uh, then we have uh, commitment management and supervision that is described by taking responsibility for the team and actively managing work performance. Uh, the third uh, component is about competent and professional staff which refers to carrying duties in accordance with organizational expectations. And these expectations are start from the description of the values and the communication. And this is this also points to compliance. Uh, effective, then effect, we have effective processes for the whole of the organization. And these are described as existence of uh, risk management and compliance with it by all staff. So that's uh, like the highlight by Sonia in her presentation that uh, individuals are not only students in academia, but the, that relates to all members of academia. It means uh, teachers, researchers, administration. Uh, and definitely this kind of uh, uh, component, it, it takes forward all managerial process. And finally, we have comprehensive and accurate monitoring systems that refer to enhancing internal reporting to early detect deviance and contribute to continuous improvement of the organization. Here, um, ethical governance is seen as a um, coherent system leading to desirable changes as well as ensuring stability. And when I um, mention stability, it means if the values are well described and explained, they should not be misinterpreted due to different situations, but they should be uh, properly followed. And if it happens so, some uh, uh, some efforts needs to be done to uh, make these changes that interpretation of values would remain uh, the same. Um, by the way, all these components that I've introduced, are, um, they are inherent in public administration, which academia is not. Uh, so the question is, how about academia? Can it uh, live in the spirit of ethical governance? Uh, and sincerely, I believe it can truly be so. Academia needs leadership that supports value of integrity, not only through speeches or strategies, but also through actions, development of mindset of like-minded people. Again, this is um, challenging given the fact that um, academic freedom and autonomy uh, are specific, interesting characteristics of academia, um, contributing fragmentally uh, to ethical governance uh, won't give the expected changes so in academia either. By establishing an ethics committee approving a code of ethics, further actions are needed, such as formal, informal, and um, non-formal education, as well as other guidance, to ensure compliance. 
then um, risk should be identified and mitigated. And this uh, step of uh, identification of risk and the mitigation is um, another important step that helps to prevent deviance as much as possible. For that purpose, um, additional rules and action might be introduced. Overall, all these need to, to be monitored in a focused manner uh, to grasp uh, the level of advancement in, in embeddedness of integrity and other values. So actually, when I see this kind of perspective, I see this kind of, um, yeah, I see this uh, components of ethical governance as very likely relevant to any sector, including academia. And for sure, uh, ethical governance is not an alien in Lithuania. Here, um, you see multiple stakeholders that contribute to, to the promotion of ethics and integrity in academia. They build ethics infrastructure, which is part of ethical governance. And this is something that I didn't discuss, but uh, I'd like to how the, there is a the uh, ethics, uh, go ethical governance and ethics infrastructure should be differentiated. So uh, just presenting a very small piece that relates to ethics infrastructure in Lithuania. So it consists of uh, here of institutions and organizations, legislations and uh, other rules, as well as uh, awareness raising. So these in bubbles are not are national, sorry, uh, and institutional bodies that bear different roles. Uh, what is essential here that there should be um, a way of complementing it, each other, but not overlapping or doubling uh, these roles. So national bodies, color it in green, uh, they operate on the principle of shared responsibility. For example, office, of the Ombudsperson for Academic Ethics and Procedure that I'm representing is responsible for providing consultancy and training to academia, uh, contextualizing academic daily practice in ethical and integrity terms, uh, handling allegations, um, and so on. Uh, then we have the Office of Equal Opportunities uh, Ombudsperson, uh, who is responsible for deterring discriminative practice in all sectors, including in academia. Meanwhile, the Chief Official Ethics Commission deals with the handling of allegations related to conflicts of interest. Uh, then we have the next one, the Office of the Inspector of Journalist Ethics, uh, that provides as well a consultancy about personal data protection for research purposes, because that relates to public exposure of research data, specifically the ones uh, uh, that contain personal data. And also we have Lithuanian Bioethics Committee that issues ethical approvals in biomedical research. So these national bodies feed into the support system to research and higher education institutions such as universities, universities of applied sciences and research institutes. So these institutions, they might be heard not only directly, but their voice uh, is transmitted through their representatives, the ones colored in blue actually. Uh, and they are, as you might see, even um, they are numerous um, in this. So what is missing in this infrastructure is the lack to address and support ethics and integrity in business practice when collaboration um, with academia is established. There could be many instances when ethics and integrity in, in such relationship uh, should be carefully considered. And for example, if we have student internship, research business collaboration, fundraising, and other initiatives where 
this research and business uh, collaboration uh, could be established, there are always some kind of potential risk that, first of all, should be identified and then the measures taken to mitigate them. So uh, this is just one episode of ethical governance, which is, I should admit, incomplete. However, I think it gives an understanding about some starting points uh, from where we should depart if we want to develop ethical governance with all their components and to see that as an efficient and effective system. What is important to, to consider in ethical governance is um, a cultural aspect as part of the context. Uh, in academia, international collaboration um, it exists for years. That's not something new. Uh, and intersectoral, intersectoral collaboration is uh, lately enhanced more intensively for very different reasons. Uh, let's say looking for relevant and innovative solutions. And there, for example, um, rules, communication practice, um, purposes of collaboration might diverge. Likewise, um, research and academic integrity systems might also diverge and actually differ. So there is no need to look even too far. For example, the bridge project port institutions from Lithuania, Sweden, Ukraine, Czechia, North Macedonia, we have different ethics infrastructure, so uh, different ethical governance. However, they are united by universally shared principle of moral conduct, because practicing should be complementing each other to develop a strong bond for further demandment. So bridging, ensuring consistency among different sectors, uh, cultivating the same values in the same way is crucial as deviance of integrity is faced um, everywhere at any stage, at, sorry, at any age um, by any community. So it does not seem that, there, that here the context might have a key role. However, uh, however, context is paramount to consider when it comes to changes management when we want something to change, when we identify some specific issue that we want to cope with and to bring uh, some solutions to, to go uh, into these um, universally applied principles of moral conduct. So to end up here, I'd like to congratulate actually the initiative of Uppsala University for having such an intricate topic in the bridge project to address as well as for gathering an uh, interdisciplinary and intersectoral team. Uh, indeed, this is not an easy task, particularly to find a way how to be on values in an academic context. And I would leave here with an explanation mark, the same question that I see is uh, probably a challenging thing in, in each international project. But I think that everyone um, uh, should reflect on when uh, going into these practices. And since uh, I started speaking about the bridge project that holds this event, I'd like to shortly share my joy about its outputs. As we're just have introduced many of them that have been already published and some others are forthcoming. So, um, I would say that some of these outputs of the bridge project such as guidelines on, or, um, for research ethics and, and research integrity in citizen science have been endorsed by other countries. And I believe um, they will continue to be appreciated worldwide. Uh, and also I'd like to thank my team and other partners of the Bridge Project who substantially contributed to them. Uh, undoubtedly, there are other useful outputs uh, for academia that were developed by this project team, as already mentioned by Sonia Checklist and uh, other forthcoming guidelines for um, integrity in research and business collaboration. So I do believe that everyone might benefit um, 
of them. So I make a, a full stop here and uh, I wish you to enjoy this event with best. Thank you.